We're so happy to have you, Dr. John Burroughs. Uh, he is a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Victoria Law School in British Columbia and Loveland Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Toronto Law School. His publications include a little bit of feedback there. If you're um, not speaking, can you mute your mics, please? His publications include Recovering Canada, the Resurgence of Indigenous Law, Canada's Indigenous Constitution, Drawing Out Law, A Spirit's Guide, Freedom and Indigenous Constitutionalism, The Right Relationship, Resurgence and Reconciliation, Law, Indigenous Ethics. He is the 2017 Killam Prize winner in Social Sciences and the 2019 Molson Prize winner from the Canada Council of the Arts, the 2020 Governor General's Innovation Award, and the 2021 Canadian Bar Association President's Award winner. He was appointed as an officer of the Order of Canada in 2020. John is a member of the Chippewas of Nawash First Nation in Ontario, Canada. Miigwech, John, happy to have you. Yay. Miigwech. <laughs> Um, it's really good to be with everyone. And I said, Buju Nidinawe Makani Dok, Nija Nishnabe, Nij Marzik, Abangi to go Ninata Nishnabem, and Gugudi to Indishnamayan, Giganos, Indishnakas, Mayashi Wenigaming and Donjaba, Niging and Dodem, and Miguech Biajayag Nungum. I really appreciate the invitation to be with you and the prayers and the welcome and just being able to visit with people before we started today. I just thought I'd share a story that I had an experience with this last week before getting into the substance of the talk. There's this man who just passed away. He was born in 1966. He was He's autistic. And I've been sort of in and out of his circles for about the last 22 years. And whenever I would see him, he's not very communicative. He, he would um, come up and shake my hand and say, what's your name? And uh, And then he would sort of take his place and just enjoy being around the other people that was a part of the event. Well, I guess about 10 days ago, they discovered he had cancer and then he went into palliative care. And um, there was this 88 year old man who's been his friend all through the years. And this man was with this person with cancer who was in palliative care. And this man has lost his mother and his father. And so this 88 year old was um, there present as uh, he was transitioning from this life to the next. And again, not very communicative, doesn't have many words, but just near the end of his life, he said to this man who had been his companion through all these years um, as a friend, said, he said, I love you. And it was just such a beautiful message to hear that uh, despite not having many words, this uh, man could recognize someone who was there for him and had been there for him through the years. And it just touched me to think about how we can be a force for good in one another's lives. Uh, we might not have many words, as uh, my friend didn't have many words, or we might be feeling frail and not be able to do much, as this 88-year-old man was comparatively. And yet there they were in a situation where the, it really marks out who we can be as human beings, how we can treat one another with love and kindness and have a measure that's not always about who gets what and the important titles that we might have or the way that we might uh, situate ourselves in broader worldly terms. The, 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 there's this value of being there and loving one another was just so powerful to have that, uh, that message, that story passed on to me. Today, I wanna to talk a bit about uh, UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and how it relates to our community and how it relates to Indigenous law more generally. And so I'm going to share the screen and um, go from there. So I'm hoping you can see this. Um, Jessica, can you put your thumbs up if you can? Great. So I've been teaching now for about 31 years in law schools, 
And I've been a student for about 40 some odd years. In fact, I turn 60 tomorrow. <laughs> it's a big day for me, uh, turning 60. But when I was a young man um, finishing law school, I, I did an LLM, a master's of law at uh, the University of Toronto. And the article is here, Genealogy of Law, Inherent Sovereignty and First Nations Self-Government. And the article was began by talking with my uncle, Fred Jones, who's Paul's dad, of course, and talking with um, Irene Akiwanzi, uh, John Nodjuin uh, was a part of that, Chick uh, Walter Johnson, uh, Basil, talked to a lot of the elders in the community about our history through the generations of governance and how we tried to preserve our own ways of making decisions and how we preserved our governance despite the challenges that we encountered. And what I wanted to do was chronicle the challenges that we had through seven generations and indicate that despite those challenges, we continue to reference our own laws. We continue to use our own governance. We continue to find that power within ourselves. And so this article is about those seven generations. And after I talked to the elders there uh, around Cape, and I went around with my mother and uh, Aunt Norma, and we had a good experience visiting uh, you know, Uncle Fred and Irene and um, Chick and Walter and others, uh, um, John Nodjuan, et cetera. Um, I then went to the archives and um, found the story that the elders were telling me in the archives as well. And so this article puts those sort of written sources together with our oral tradition. And um, so on the screen before you is to come say, um, to walk across. And we've got many stories in our community about Tecumseh and how we're related to him. And I remember once talking with Darlene and she made a connection to Tecumseh and a woman named Wasega Boa, who apparently is um, our, our third uh, great aunt. And uh, so we learned about uh, her in that setting, um, as well as uh, Tecumseh. And the challenge that he faced in his life, of course, is that there were people coming to try to take our land from war, for, by war. And he created alliances to help deal with um, that so that we wouldn't just be subject to other people. Um, of course, we also had to deal with a lot of challenges of people settling on their lands. And there were promises that were made, like through the Treaty of Niagara, to ensure that we could continue to live on our own lands in accordance with our own laws. And there were different values that were introduced from other parts of the world. And so this third generation, my third great, great, great uh, grandfathers and grandmothers is what I looked at in this setting, uh, in particular Giganos, who is my third great grandfather. And I remember um, Fred talking about when Giganos died, um, his partner, his wife, um, um, married a person named Seiko, and uh, Seiko and um, um, his wife are actually buried somewhere out behind where Uncle Fred, uh, where now Paul uh, has a place. Anyways, in that third generation back, uh, through people like Kigano, Seiko, um, Tecumseh, Wasega Boa, uh, we pushed back against those who wanted to take our lands by war. Uh, we created treaties um, with many nations including the British crown through the Treaty of Niagara. Um, we also had to deal with religion and we took religion on in our own terms using our own values. And so there was much to learn in that generation about our laws continuing despite the presence of other people coming into our territory. Of course, the next generation here is uh, uh, Giganos's son, Peter Giganos Jones. And then on the other side here is a representation of Margaret McLeod, who is his partner, his wife, and the stories that she told to Verna Patronella Johnson that are written down in this book, Tales of Nokomis. What's important about this for our governance is that, of course, there's Peter entering into treaties. You can see around his neck that treaty medal um, and putting his otter dotum on the parchment that agreed to share the land in accordance with our own traditions up the Bruce Peninsula and around the area reserving to ourselves the right to hunt and fish and have reserves and have infrastructure and have healthcare and education, et cetera. So that was preserved in that generation. And then you also see around his neck is another medal, which is a medal that he received from rescuing a surveyor out of the bush around Markdale. 
um, someone got in trouble after the treaty, they're trying to mark out the land. And you know, part of our obligations in the treaty was to be able to assist others. And he, of course, did assist others. And he's got that medal to demonstrate that it wasn't always just acrimonious and conflict between ourselves and the settlers there on the peninsula. In fact, we came to one another's aid. We helped one another. We tried to benefit from one another. We tried to have a mutual beneficial uh, relationship there. And so we- Sorry, we're just go ahead. having a little bit of feedback. So if everyone could mute their mic, just check it out. Thank you. Yeah, that's me. That's all that feedback. Oh, that's, I think it's Paul. <laughs> Paul, Paul, can you mute your mic? I think he's trying there. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I'll just shut this down. Just at the bottom left corner of Zoom. There we go. Maybe as he's working on that, I'll just talk a little bit more. Hopefully you can hear. Um, so on the other side of the page there is Margaret McLeod's stories. Um, and in the, the preface of the book, um, Verna talks about Margaret telling her these stories. And then Margaret saying that these stories came to her from her great, great, great grandmothers. And so what I'm saying here is that we encountered challenges in our territory to our governance by signing treaties and creating good relationships with people through the work that Peter uh, did. And you might also know he walked down Young Street in the Mackenzie Rebellion of 1837 uh, in, uh, in Upper Canada. So he wanted to ensure that there was a kind of government in Canada that wasn't just based on um, closed ways of thinking. The, the rebellion was about having more participation in our society. And then on the other side with Margaret's uh, work, she preserved the stories and through our stories are our laws, the principles and processes that we need to be able to make decisions about how we should live our lives together. Those stories are like cases that we often talk about in the common law context. And these are stories like how the stunk, skunk got its stripe or the jewel weed, or you, you can read through uh, the pine um, and the birch tree. And, and all of those contain lessons of governance, of law, of how we should treat one another with respect, with humility, with truth, with kindness, with bravery. Um, they're just there um, to be able to feast on. Um, as you may know, uh, Margaret uh, came from a, a, a union where Teresa Riel was uh, married to Joseph McLeod, and they were living in the La Cloche area. And uh, that uh, family line came down from La Cloche into Cape Croker, and then, of course, uh, here where they have this marriage and they have uh, many children that flow from this marriage. Margaret uh, was also a linguist speaking French and English in Anishinaabe Mwen. And she also was a medicine woman. She was very, very uh, skilled uh, with mashkike and understanding the plant knowledge in our communities. That's another way of preserving governance, right? Not preserving our language and preserving our knowledge of the natural world, including the medicines that surround us. So if you look back to this generation before, we see steps were taken to continue our law through, um, through pushing back against war and signing treaties and receiving things like religion on our own terms. And in this generation, entering into treaties and trying to have more representative forms of government and ensuring that our stories were continued, our languages continued, and our knowledge of the medicines were continued. Probably many of you have seen this picture. This is my great grandfather, uh, Charles Giganos uh, Jones, and he was there uh, for almost 100 years. And as you know, um, he was a very strong person. When he was 98, he walked in from the woods with a, a deer on his back. He was also a runner. He could run between Cape and Toronto in about six days, and Cape and Ottawa in about six days. And, between uh, Toronto and, and what's Detroit, Windsor area in about eight days. He could run all over the countryside with the messages that were carried from this function of being a runner, being a messenger. And he knew how to live off the land because of what his own mother taught him about the medicines uh, and whatnot. And um, he was also a very uh, loving person, um, you know, not only having many children of his own, but adopting children. And uh, we recently had, um, 
um, a death in the family, as you know, uh, the last uh, living adopted child of um, CK uh, just passed on, walked on. You can see the work that he did there. He was a part of the um, building of that Methodist church on the reserve. And uh, he was also a leader, not only in a hereditary light, but also in an elected light, being a chief or counselor for about 50 years of his life. Some people say that, you know, the Indian Act has extinguished our governance. And when I looked at the band records when he was in power for about 20 years or working with others, sharing our ideas about how to live with one another, the band records uh, reference our own values our own laws, our own ways of being. And so our governance wasn't extinguished by the Indian Act. Our governance, our law wasn't extinguished by the Indian Act. We continued to take decisions that were in accordance with our own values. Yes, it was constrained. It would have been nicer to not have the Indian Act there, but nevertheless, it didn't uh, take away those things that we had before. And many of you might know this man, Josh, uh, my grandpa, uh, outside the old cabin there um, on the reserve where Uncle Howard uh, now has uh, his place. My sister's outside the cabin there when she was a young uh, woman. And Josh um, is kind of representative of many folks uh, during this era, the challenges of the day school, the challenges of uh, racism and colonialism and the difficulties that uh, were created because of that uh, narrowed opportunities. But he always took action. He he didn't uh, just sit back. He got involved. And as you may know, if you know him, he has a great sense of humor. Um, and he would use that humor to try to preserve our own ways of looking at the world. And uh, he he also was kind of a runner. He was a rum runner during the <laughs> temperance era between uh, Detroit and Windsor, ferrying spirits, liquor back and forth across the border. Uh, making his way that way. He was down in Kentucky, from what we understand for a while, uh, teaching people about medicines in that area because of what he learned from his great grandma. He was then moved on. You can see the, the little image in the far left corner. He was part of the First Americans, which was a, a Native American First Nations group in uh, Hollywood that uh, they uh, banded together to make um, friends with one another in that film. He was also a trickster you can see standing with his pants down <laughs> on that other picture that's in the left-hand side on the bottom. He's just a wonderful man that was resilient. And our people are resilient. And yes, he could have challenges like we can all have challenges. He said, you know, um, we're like we're all like Swiss cheese. Uh, we're full of holes, but we're also pretty good. And certainly he was like that in his life. He didn't he wasn't a, a saint, uh, but he was pretty good, Nishishin, as he would often say. And so we see that uh, that despite the challenges in life, uh, our our resilience continues. We continue to reference laws in our accordance with our own values. And then, of course, we married uh, people from other parts of the world. Uh, there's CK uh, with Ella, um, who is his partner for many years. His first wife was uh, Amelia Chichok from down here in Toronto, uh, the credit area. Um, she died after having a couple of uh, children, and then uh, Ella came into his life, and I think they had about 10 children together. And then you can see my grandpa Josh married Yuna, and a wonderful woman who was also very resourceful. I'm so grateful that she was my grandma. And then you see my mom as a young woman there in the corner with my dad, who uh, grew up in Yorkshire uh, at the time of the Second World War and was traumatized by all those bombs that fell around his home. And so when he could leave that uh, site of war, he came across to Canada and lived um, with my mom for 66 years, including the last 30 of his years on the reserve there at Cape. Here's my mom um, and me as a little boy coming into her arms. What I'm trying to say here is that there's a continuity of our governance from generation to generation where we pass along our, our knowledge of uh, treaties and our spirituality and our language and our stories and our resilience and our love for one another. And yes, we're full of holes. Yes, we have all these challenges, but we're still there and we're still here. And there's still ways that we make decisions um, by this passage of uh, tradition. And then here's my oldest, the youngest daughter with her back facing to you um, at our powwow at Cape. Uh, she's a jingle dress 
uh, dancer, uh, Gigata is her name, uh, Lindsay is her name. She's now a law professor at Queen's University, teaching Indigenous legal methods and also Indigenous environmental governance. And then in the small corner here is my other daughter, Megan, who we call Chick Chick Chigatase, uh, Chickadee, and she has autism. And so that story that I started out with, with that man that wasn't very communicative, I kind of feel a kinship to um, that man that passed on because I feel such a great love for my daughter who has autism. And you know what? Those people with vulnerabilities in our community continue to teach us about what it means to um, live minopamatsuin, to watch out for others, to look out for others. As you know, we have the daycare there at Cape Croker, she may. And if you hear those birds calling out in the snow, she may, she may, she may. That's they're looking out for one another in their vulnerabilities. I remember Basil telling me those stories about how the chickadees are our teachers about how we should look after the little ones amongst us. And I find my daughter, my oldest daughter, has that uh, teaching that she passes along to me. And I'm grateful that our word for she may is on that building at Cape and is, is, a, is an encouragement to us to look out for our little brothers and sisters because that's a part of our legal traditions as well. And then I now feel fortunate to be a, a, a grandpa, a um, Shomis. And so on the left-hand side there is my oldest granddaughter. Her name is Wasea, um, light to shining bright and clear. Uh, Wasea is also a family name. It's our third great aunt, Waseance, Aunt Mary. Uh, Waseance uh, is where that comes in. That my, that's my sister's Anishinaabe name, Jennifer as well. She goes by the name Waseance. Um, so there's Wasea in this generation. And then on the other side is Akika. Aki meaning earth, Ka meaning fullness or lots of earth. And we were just with them uh, about a week and a half ago. And uh, it was just wonderful to snuggle with them and to tell them Nanabush stories, to tell them creation stories, to tell them about our treaties with the Hoof Nation, to talk to them about our plants and our medicines. In other words, we can continue to pass along our laws as we're gathered together with one another in our families and help them understand um, the beauty of our life um, as uh, Anishinaabe and of course other people in the world. And so the point I'm trying to make here is this is following along from my, my LLM, which is to say our law is our own, um, and it comes from our clans, it comes from our families, it comes from our teachings, it comes from our treaties, it comes from our language, it comes from the steps that we took and are continuing to take to ensure that um, we are referencing our own values and learning from other values as they come to us from other parts of the world. So with that, we now have this thing called UNDRIP, which is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I want to talk about how UNDRIP might have potential reinforcing value to the things that we are preserving and that we're continuing on. So here's an act that was passed by Parliament, I think in 2019. And you can read here that the purpose of this act are to affirm this declaration as a universal international human rights instrument with application in Canadian law and to provide a framework for the Government of Canada's implementation of the declaration. The Act says that the Government of Canada must, in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples, take all measures necessary to ensure that the laws of Canada are consistent with the declaration. And let me just pause here and say what the declaration really is about is giving us the recognition to bring forth our own laws into our own governing spaces, our own homeland, but also when governments interact with us to ensure that Indigenous law is really the guiding force in our agendas. So this, this idea that the government of Canada must ensure that the laws of Canada are consistent with the declaration for me is saying the government must ensure that the laws of Canada are consistent with our laws. Because the declaration says we have a right to self-determination. And so the government of Canada must ensure that their laws are consistent with our laws, are consistent with our self-determination. That's the point that I'm trying to make here this evening. And there's an action plan that has to be developed to achieve that purpose. 
and it talks about some of the content of that action plan dealing with uh, many of the indignities we faced as Indigenous peoples. And then there's a monitoring aspect to this, a timeline aspect to this, and a report to Parliament. So there's legislation that's attempting to implement a recognition of this document, which I'm saying is a, should be a recognition of our laws, our customs, and our self-determination. So what are some of the clauses in UNDRIP? You might have talked about this last week, but I'll just review some of this again. Self-determination is there in clause after clause after clause, that we have a right to freely determine our social, economic, and political matters, that we have a right to protect our knowledges, our culture, life ways through practices, languages, media, and religion. We have decision-making uh, rights recognized in this declaration. We have health care rights recognized in this declaration. We have the rights to ensure that groups within our nations are protected, our elders, women, our children. Uh, we have land rights uh, in this declaration from ownership, including the repatriation of our lands or the return of our lands. There's also provisions for protecting our environment and then our relations with uh, larger nation states. So the, 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 the 46 articles of UNDRIP are very, very um, generous in terms of what they purport to recognize and affirm. Here's just a couple of those articles to read out to you. Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely to pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Or in other words, the people of the Saugeen Anishinaabe Nation, or Neashi Wittigaming, has the right to self-determination. And by virtue of our right as a uh, Saugeen Anishinaabe Nation, or Neashi Wittigaming, we freely determine our political status and pursue our social, economic, and cultural development. And we have autonomy in that, in this Article 4, in our internal and local affairs. And so there's uh, a big... Uh, uh, aspect of this, which is about the, de the Declaration facilitating our laws. The last article of the Declaration says that it can't be construed in a way that would dismember, impair totally or in part the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. So this is a clause that says this self-determination is exercised in the context of the Canadian setting. Um, but if we interpret our treaties, We've entered into treaties with our uh, partners such that we're trying to respect them as they also are pledged to respect us. And that's not happened. And so we're trying to um, create incentives for our treaties to be implemented through the cases that we have and the negotiations that we get involved with. And I know so many people do, just do that in many ways, like, you know, in the band council setting or water walkers or in our Medewin societies, or just as many ways that we go about trying to implement our self-determination, and this is what is respected there. This declaration has to be implemented in cooperation with us. So you see these articles uh, before you. Um, Article 5 there is these right, right again to these institutions that we participate in our own, while we also can freely participate in the political, economic, social, and cultural life of the state. This is what people in the 1960s called Citizens Plus, that Indigenous peoples are Citizens Plus. We have all the rights of Canadian citizens, but we also have the plus rights of being Indigenous to this country as well. And this Article 5 kind of makes this point of being Citizens Plus. We also have a right to participate in decision-making in the state in matters that would affect our rights through representatives and chosen by ourselves, in accordance with our own procedures and to develop our own decision-making institutions. So we have the Anishinaabe right to make decisions in accordance with our laws, with our values, with our institutions. And if the state wants to deal with us, Article 19, they have to do so by consulting and cooperating with us in good faith. And they have to ensure that when they deal with us, they, they secure our free, prior, and informed consent before adopting any measures that uh, might affect our rights. So this is called FPIC, uh, the Free Prior and Informed Consent, which is a way of implementing this notion of consultation and cooperation. It's interesting to break down that language in Anishinaabemwin 
you know, free, what does free mean? What does prior mean? What does in, what is informed mean? I've done that to etymology at some point. And it's a beautiful set of teachings if you think about that from our own linguistic perspective. Um, we also have the right to have legislative measures to achieve the end of the declaration and financial and technical assistance from states uh, to achieve the rights of the declaration. So the citizens plus idea is not like, okay, you've got this plus now, just go out and do it on your own. If we want to have a relationship with the state to protect our education or our healthcare or our social services or our environment, because other people are using that as well, um, we have the right to not just pay for that on our own dime, uh, but to ensure that there's involvement by the state in, in supporting us, assisting us financially and technically to achieve the aims of the Declaration. This is an instrument of international human rights. Um, so when we think about uh, this concept of the Declaration, um, we're thinking about it in terms of the post-war period. As you know, in the Second World War, there was a genocide and six million Jews lost their lives, as well as uh, many um, people who had special needs. Uh, they were targeted by the, uh, the uh, Nazis at that period. And so coming out of the Second World War, there was a need to say, people have human rights. You cannot just purport to exercise unilateral authority over them. Um, they have things that are inherently invested in their own beings. And what are some of those rights as talked about in the Declaration? Here they are. Um, religion, spiritual beliefs and practices, speech and expression. These are the things we have as Anishinaabe people, as human rights in the Declaration. These are things that are mentioned in the Declaration. Um, association, life, liberty and security, property, family togetherness, a right not to be discriminated against by our own governments, the privileges and immunities of our own citizenship, um, rights to language, rights to education, rights to labor fairness, rights to fairness of governing bodies, so, you know, notice and fairness, hearing, healthcare rights, as I mentioned before, gender equality. These are things that we should expect the government will implement through the declaration. And these are the rights in the declaration that the government has signed on to in um, and agreeing to the declaration and then implementing it through legislation. Now we have to hold them to their word. Right? The, the, the passage of the, the act is just the beginning of the process now to ensure that all the laws of Canada become consistent with the declaration such that we have all of these protections. But what I also want to suggest here is that our own governments should also be implementing the declaration. Right? We are nations as First Nations. It's not just Canada that has as a nation that has an obligation to implement UNDRIP, we also have an obligation to take those rights on the prior page and Anishinaabeize them. Uh, you know, understand what our, uh, what our values are, whoops, in relationship to spirituality, speech, expression, life, liberty, security, um, education, healthcare, gender, etc. These are things we should expect from the Saugeen Anishinaabe nation, as well as expect from the nation of Canada, as well as expect, hopefully one day, from the province of Ontario too. And here's some examples in the United States of uh, First Nations tribes, as they're called down there, um, recognizing and implementing UNDRIP uh, through uh, these many pathways. Some, some First Nations endorse the declaration, like the Cherokee Nation did in 2014, and saying, just like Canada said, we're gonna make our laws, Canada says we're gonna make our laws, consistent with the Declaration, the Cherokee Nation said, we're going to make our laws consistent with the Declaration. And you see this wholesale adoption here of the Muscogee as well. Look what they did. They prepared a report to assess whether or not their own internal laws were consistent with the Declaration, and whether the First Nation is following those laws. And they created an action plan to achieve the Declaration's objectives. They translated the Declaration into their own language. I mentioned that action plan there. And then they're trying to take measures necessary to ensure that their laws are consistent with the Declaration. It'd be interesting to see what that might look like 
at Cape or at Saugeen <clears throat> to um, say, here's our challenge. We, we can wait around for the government to get their act in order, but while the government's getting their act in order, this is much more close to who we are. We have this in our power and we could make language laws, cultural laws, religion laws, free prior informed consent laws, laws around our children, the environment, gender, economic development, education, land rights, whatever the case might be. There's just you know chances for us to take those paths. And there's other nations that have done this amongst the Anishinaabe for a number of years. Here's the Chippewa tribe of Minnesota. They set up their constitution in 1934. Uh, but you know they say that uh, there's these rights that are found now in the Declaration that they guarantee to their own citizens. So the Anishinaabe people of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe have freedom of religion and conscience in their communities, have freedom of speech in their communities, orderly association assembly. If there's a grievance they have, they have a right to petition for that. And then they have due process of law, which means that the law is going to be transparent. It's going to be not hidden. It's going to be available for all to participate in. Here's the Wikwemakong um, application of some of these values. Every Wikwemakong Anishinaabek is equal before and under the law and under uh, without discrimination. And they have rights to vote and participate in decision making and applying for programs and services and being served in a manner that's free from discrimination and arbitrariness and right to practice their Aboriginal rights and their spirituality and their human rights, and not to have their possessions taken without uh, some justification for that, a right to seek remedy from chief and council, um, and then a responsibility to uphold the laws of Wiki as well. Here's uh, another uh, Odawa folks in Michigan, uh, Anishinaabe people as well, also have a, um, a self-governing expression to uh, these, these freedoms that we've been talking about um, as a part of their way of being. The White Earth Constitution is interesting. I love the preamble. The Anishinaabe of the White Earth Nation are successors of a great tradition of continental liberty, a native constitution of families, totemic associations. The Anishinaabe creates stories of natural reason, of courage, loyalty, human, humor, spiritual inspiration, survivance, reciprocal altruism, and native cultural sovereignty. We, the Anishinaabe of the White Earth Nation, in order to secure an inherent and essential sovereignty to promote our traditions of liberty and justice and peace and reserve common resources and establish an annual rights of native government for our posterity, do constitute or today this, establish this constitution of the White Earth First Nation. And they've got all sorts of things that are in the document that are kind of declaration type provisions, including this one, freedom of thought and conscience, I love this idea of artistic irony <laughs> and literary expression. And this, these things cannot be overturned by their own government, let alone the broader Canadian government. And here's the Anjouanong uh, constitution. This uh, draws from the larger constitution making that's going on amongst the Anishinaabe nation. But you can see Ningwadwe Wangazit Anishinaabe, one Anishinaabe family. Creator placed the Anishinaabe on the earth along with the gift of spirituality. Here on Mother Earth, there were gifts given to the Anishinaabe to look after fire, earth, uh, water, earth, and wind. Uh, the creator also gave the Anishinaabe the sacred seven, seven sacred gifts to guide them. This is again, this is how they're implementing ideas that are found in the um, declaration. But we're using our own words, right? Love, truth, respect, wisdom, humility, honesty, and bravery. These are ways of us getting our own implementation of these. Creator gave us sovereignty to govern ourselves. We respect and honor the past and present and future. So all of these are different examples 
of what we might do at Cape or amongst the Saugeen and Anishinaabe to implement the declaration on our own. We don't have to use their words or the White Earth or the Odawa or the Anjunan. You know, we can find our own language. But the point is, if we implement the declaration, then when the government comes along to us and says, you know, we need to consult with you to have free prior informed consent to ensure that we're being consistent with the declaration, we have ready-made sets of tools that are already existing in our own community um, that we can say, well, look what we've done. It's, it's like a laboratory of experimentation to implement the declaration in our own terms. And then we just, uh, we, we can lead. We can be the examples of what might follow there. And then there's British Columbia acts that are implementing this declaration and they have action plans as well, annual reports. And as a part of their work, they're actually amending acts of the provincial legislature in British Columbia to make them consistent with the declaration. It's hard to imagine that happening in Ontario right now, but I can imagine that there will be a day not too far down the road where another government is going to want to implement the declaration and pass a legislation and create an action plan and have an annual report, which will lead to the amendment of legislation in Queen's Park. Um, but while we're waiting for that day, there's things that we can do such that we're showing the way uh, because of our own laws, our own continuation. I'm just gonna finish here in a few minutes and then hopefully we can have a discussion for whatever an hour that you might want. Uh, but this is to think about what does law mean in our uh, understanding? Well, as you may know, Anishinaabewin is 70 to 80% verbs when you speak. And so whenever you talk about law, you're talking about law as a verb. It's an action. It's an activity. It's something that you do. So think about law as not something that's done to you by another group. Think about law as something we do together amongst ourselves. This is one word for law. There's others. There's Ijatwawanan, and Kajkanwejawanan, and... Uh, there's just other words for law, but this one, unakonage, is to make a judgment, decide things in a certain way, agree on something. And then this is from the Minnesota Anishinaabe Dictionary. You can see the breaking down of the morphemes of anakon is the stem, and gay is to act upon. And then if you see what, what is that stem, anakon, it's in a certain direction or manner, which actually refers to auk, which is a stick-like wooden, organic or solid, it's something we act on by hand. Or here's a law ruling or agreement. So what does this mean? What is this telling us about law amongst the Anishinaabe? Well, you're using a stick to measure something. You're using a stick to measure how you might act. And that measurement, that stick, is used against a broader set of patterns to determine what you need to do, what we need to do, to you know, have greater peace and order in our own communities. So here's another way of thinking about this. What is law? It's not something that just a parliament or legislature or court does, or police or you know, prime ministers and ministers of the crown. Law is something human communities do, and we've done for generations. That's why I started my talk in this way, because we didn't need a parliament or a legislature. We had standards, measures, benchmarks, indicia, guidelines, signposts, criteria, intellectual and cultural resources, principles and processes for regulating our affairs, marking our decisions, and resolving our disputes. In other words, to go back here for a second, right? we have measures. That's what our law is. We had ways of measuring what we should do when we were living in our families and governing with one another through council processes and, and using that those measures, this is what we did and this is what we can do and continue to do often in the future. What we're, what we're hopeful that we can do is identify our standards, measures, benchmarks, indicia, guidelines, signposts, criteria, principles and processes, right? This is, this is within our power. And, and the declaration um, is an invitation to look to our own governance and our own traditions to, to revitalize our law, to see the resurgence of our law, to, to see the more explicit 
guidance that we would take by our own measures and signposts and principles and processes, again, to see um, that you know our anakonege uh, could be um, further uh, facilitated. This is, of course, something we did with the Crown um, over 250 years ago at Niagara. When I did my PhD, I focused on these treaties. 84 belts uh, circulated in 1764, 20, 24 different nations representing 2,000 2, people gathered in Niagara, representing 24 different nations, including our uh, Anishinaabe people, linking arms together with the Crown to support one another, polishing this covenant chain that the Haudenosaunee had, inviting us into that chain and having that extended. You can see the dish with one spoon wampum there with the Haudenosaunee where we agreed to share with one another. And you can see the Turo wampum there as well, this nation to nation relationship that we have with the crown. To me, this is what the declaration looked like 250 years ago, right? So before we had all of those fancy words and those clauses, this is about our self-determination and how our self-determination interacts with the crown. And in our self-determination interacting with the crown, You've got our people linking arms together with people coming from different parts of the world to try to preserve peace and friendship and respect, to try to um, live in accordance with our laws that flow from our clans and our families. And so there we go, just a beginning of a opportunity to think about what the declaration might mean and uh, hopefully generated some food for thought for questions and comments and sidetracks uh, just to uh, to get us deeper into this uh, this notion of andrip so miigwech bizindueg miu ahau and